almost every problem America has faced in the last 40 or 50 years have been problems that could be cured by money spending. We now are facing a problem that you cannot spend your way out of. So if this world is going to thrive, the dollar as we know it has to die. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, February 13th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, February 13th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe, hit that bell to be notified on updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We truly do appreciate your support. Dr. Stephen Lieb joins us today. Dr. Lieb is an investment advisor and money manager who has been analyzing financial markets for over 40 years. Known for his ability in connecting the dots among hidden or overlooked trends, being macroeconomic, scientific, and geopolitical, Dr. Lieb accurately describes the investment implications often going against conventional wisdom. He's also the author of nine books on investing and geopolitical trends, including his most recent book, China's Rise and the New Age of Gold, How Investors Can Profit from the Changing World. And we are delighted to have him here today as a first-time guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Dr. Stephen Lieb. Dr. Lieb, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? It's a pleasure being here, and I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thanks for coming on board. Glad to have you as a first-time guest. Really excited to get a chance to talk to you. Dr. Lieb, how did your interest in China begin? Well, by seeing uh, basically in the first part of this century, uh, China just really emerge in, in, in such a rapid fashion. And being aware that uh, China was following, uh, you know, much the same path that so many other Asian countries had followed, like South Korea, like Singapore, uh, like Japan in the early days, um, and uh, Taiwan, certainly. And uh, China was huge. I mean, that was one of the major differences between, you know, China and the other, you know, smaller Asian countries. Uh, South Korea, I think, was probably the larger, the largest of the uh, of the Asian countries. But uh, China was was a massive country, and they had a what a five thousand year history. And I thought they had to be watched. I mean, it basically was my belief that uh, eventually East and West had to come together, and I thought China's rise could be very, very significant. And in that happening. I was worried about the United States. I thought that we had really lost our mojo, uh, certainly by the first part of this century. Uh, I wrote a book in 1999, you know, outlining that we really weren't prepared for the uh, rise of the East and the rise of China. And uh, by 2005 or the early part of the cen earlier part of the century, I became really aware that we were not prepared and I started watching China ever more closely and what I saw, you know, convinced me ever more that we had to deal with China, but not as an enemy so much as a, you know, a rising power that we wanted to, you know, as best we could cooperate. You know, Dr. Lieb, it's been a decade since Red Alert, one of your books were, was uh, published. Is China's growing prosperity still a threat to the American way of life? Well, I think you know, I, in in a sense, it depends. <laughs> uh, it's prosperity. Uh, it, it can be viewed as a threat. There's, you know, I understand why people view it as a, as a threat. America has not had any real threats to its prosperity or to its position in the world, uh, probably since the uh, beginning of the uh, 19th century, uh, when it was, I guess, to some extent, still vying with Britain, but. Uh, in, in the sense of if America desires to be number one in today's world, uh, in that sense, it would be a threat. But on the other hand, I, I view it a little bit differently. I think America over the last 50 years has lost its way. I really do. Uh, we used to be a very cohesive uh, uh, country. We had our... We had our battles, but they were sort of battles among a family. 
Uh, today, America is no longer a family. It's a collection of, uh, I don't want to say it, but it's a collection of secular religions. I mean, it, it, democracy, I mean, Democrats within democracy are, are religion within democracy. Uh, Republicans are another religion. Uh, you turn on one one set of TV channels, you get the uh, one religious point of view, the Republican point of view, another set, you get a Democratic point of view. It's not a country of, of one anymore. And I, I felt that, you know, China in the mix and possibly coming together to solve major problems affecting not just America, not just China, not just Asia, not just the West, but the entire planet could actually be very good for America. It could bring back that kind of spirit that we once had, that creative spirit that we had in this country that was so great. All the technologies that you see today are American. But uh, if you look at who is most advanced in, mo in most, almost all those initial technologies from semiconductors to uh, artificial intelligence, those that developed out of the uh, transistor, it's basically China at this point who has, you know, an edge. And that that's a credit to China as much, but it's also the result of a decline in America. And I want to see America become a great country again. And I want to see the world work as one because right now we don't have American problems. We don't have Chinese problems. We have worldwide problems. And if we don't solve those problems, uh, everybody on this planet is going to be in a lot of trouble. So I think China gives us a chance to come together. It gives us a chance to establish the kind of discipline that led to the greatness of this country, the co that this country once had. And it could be a very positive influence on America. Or it could end up you know, ending in chaos and catastrophe. I mean, it, I, I don't think there's a real way of predicting right now, but pointing out the importance of coming together, I think, is very, very important. Yeah, amen to that. You know, Dr. Lee, does the, does the political or economic ideology matter when it comes to prosperity? Say, for instance, uh, China is a communist type of government. Does this really matter when it comes to prosperity? Well, I think if China, you know, all these terms like communists, uh, they're very broad and they can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, they're certainly not com in communists in the sense that Mao may, may have been a communist or, that, or in the sense that Marx conceived of communism. I mean, they're, I would probably view China as a type of autocracy uh, a, a type of a capitalistic autocracy. It has a central leader right now. I mean, I think she is one of the strongest leaders the country's ever had uh, over the last, you know, most of the century. I think it was more, you know, the, 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 the Politburo. Now there's a single member of the Politburo that really does stand out. Uh, but um, it's, there's capitalism. I mean, it's the, the, the Politburo, she doesn't own the companies. He doesn't own the uh, factors of production. I mean, he makes the rules just as our Congress makes the rules. Uh, and, you know, you need rules in, in any form of government. Uh, so to say they're communists, I would say that they're more aut autocrat autocratic. But even, you know, when you study it and, you know, I don't pretend to be an expert on politics, but, you know, the Chinese leaders from what I gather, and I, you know, talked to to a number of you know Chinese people about this, and you know, read. I mean, they're drawn from a party of about a hundred million in the Communist Party. I mean, that's a larger collection of people than we have Democrats or Republicans in this country, and it's a larger collection of people than I think any party in the world. I mean, there might be an Indian party that is almost as large, but I mean, a uh, hundred million people is a lot of people from whom to select, you know, the leaders and the leaders, you know, I, mean, I guess the general committee or the general, the overseer, I mean, the people that, that represent the communist party are selected at the local level. So, I mean, there's not, it's not a democracy. Certainly it's different than a democracy. I mean, you don't have every 
you don't have 1.4 billion people participating in the uh, selection, but you do have a, you know, it's a meritocracy. It's a, it's a, it's sort of an autocratic merit, meritocratic form of capitalism. Some, you know, not exactly, you know, there are state owned companies or state managed companies, but you know, in the United States, I think our greatest company, probably the most important country, a company for our success was a company that was, uh, basically run by the uh, United States. It was AT&T before they broke up. Virtually every invention that you can think of from the semiconductor to the laser to uh, the internet to uh, superconductivity, any of today's buzzwords originated in Bell Labs, which was a division of AT&T and AT&T was a nationwide uh, utility that was basically under the auspices of the United States government. They set the rules, how much they could charge, uh, you know, phone company or people that use their services and their services were, you know, basically a monopoly. So, you know, having this kind of structure really is not that foreign, even to countries that, you know, are clearly democratic as the U.S. was in the, uh, you know, aftermath of the Second World War and that are uh, clearly capitalistic. Uh, they still need, you know, combat, combining private and public is, you know, very, very important and can be critical. And I think we lost a lot when we lost Bell Labs and we became, you know, kind of the wild west of capitalism. You know, everything goes, anything goes. And it's not just a question of what what's going to work 10 years from now. I mean, it's a question of what's going to work five months from now. I mean, you, you can't create a transistor in today's uh, America. I think it's very, very difficult to do because it would not have immediate applications. I mean, transistor was invented during the war. And, and for a long time, I mean, the story was telling somebody, Intel used to be the shining light of our technology industry. And you could trace Intel's leadership back to the inventor of the transistor, which was Shockley. He, I think, was the chief inventor. Three people got the Nobel Prize. But when I started uh, following Intel, it was probably in the 80s. And Gordon Moore was then the uh, chief executive officer. Well, he had worked for somebody who worked for Shockley. He was in turn replaced by someone else who worked for Moore, who worked for somebody who worked for Noyce, who worked for Shockley. You, you could trace the... the, the, the uh, the management heritage, the management legacy of Intel back to the originator of the transistor. And during that period of time, Intel was just an extraordinary company. I mean, an incredible franchise. I mean, a lot of what we see today came out of Intel laboratories, more refined today, but basically the creation of, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, central core, the uh, GPU of a computer, that was Intel. And we, we, we sort of lost that uh, when basically money became too much a part of our society. Not money for the sake of improving productivity, but money for the sake of money. And that was a, that, that, that what set it, that's what set us back. And I think that, again, cooperating in these major worldwide problems like sustainable society. We need a sustainable society today. We didn't 30 years ago because the emerging economies were, were not emerging. I mean, they were a very small part of the overall world economic pie, but that did change with China. And that I think really alerted me that this was going to be a completely different world. And when I wrote Red Alert, I wanted people to wake up and realize that there are other technologies out there. Uh, and there were other things that we had to be very concerned about. Re uh, uh, you know, rare earths was one thing that, I, that was obvious. And we, we've done nothing about that or very little about that over the last 10 years. So I'm in, in a sense, yes, I still think that you could regard China as a threat to our prosperity if you regard our prosperity as being one with our being number one in the world, China definitely is a threat to that. I don't think they necessarily are going to, 
I don't think I don't really think they aspire to be number one in the world, but they aspire to, you know, be as successful as they can. And I think that that does pose a threat to people who want it to be a threat. But on the other hand, I try and view it as a positive because maybe that will help us get back on the right road. I mean, we tend to be a very creative people and I think that we need someone to really something to really push us. And if we can come together east and west, China and the U.S., we have a chance to make this world so much better than it is today and to solve these kinds of problems, to really create a sustainable planet. I mean, I, I don't want to talk like some sort of quixotic nut, but uh, to, to, to create a planet that, you know, can actually go up and mine the moon, which we may have to do in order to have sustainable energy. We may need fusion uh, technologies. And in order to have fusion technologies, you're literally going to have to get elements like helium-3 on the moon. And we can all go to the moon, but if we go to the moon separately, it's different than going together and figuring out a plan to bring back the helium-3 to use it in uh, creating fusion reactors here. I mean, fusion is a clean kind of energy which doesn't leave any real waste if done in the right way. So you don't have the, uh, uh, the problems as you do with nuclear. That's just one example. Obviously, wind, solar, all the other... Uh, um, examples of clean and sustainable energy ways of, uh, of uh, uh, reusing uh, materials, new materials that we're going to need in order to, you know, basically say, hey, we're now living on a planet and, and we basically don't have to rely on a finite amount of resources. We can basically take co <coughs> be confident that we have the resources to continue to live and to improve, and as long as we maintain our discipline. Yeah, you mentioned a couple of interesting things there, you know, with the, with the um, transistors, of course, the semiconductors, and we're having issues with chips and rare earth metals. We're having issues with the rare earth. So, yeah, those things, they, they definitely are coming into play now, and, and we are going to need to find alternatives or even substitutes but Dr. Lee, you said in the past that China is not seeking worldwide hegemony. But why do you say this and what is China seeking then? I think China is seeking the very best for their people, period. I think that, uh, you know, you, you I, I don't think China's main goal is to preserve their, is, is to succeed to a number one position in the world. I think that their number one goal is to do the best they can for the Chinese people. I think that she has made this very, very clear in my opinion. And uh, that's, I think, a difference that we don't perceive. I mean, we believe that China is this uh, very aggressive power that wants to uh, uh, take over everything. But if you look at China's history, when was the last war China fought? I mean, of any meaning. Uh, I think maybe the Korean War. I mean, I'm trying to think. I think they had some some scraps with India, but I mean, the latest war with India. I mean, it, you you don't divide two major countries uh, like India and China because you have fistfights on the battlefield. I mean, that's basically it was it's not a war. Um, I mean, if you're looking at it, if you're a man from Mars landing on Earth. Who would you think is more aggressive, uh, a country that fights wars thousands of miles away and has had, I don't know how many wars and spent how many trillions of dollars, or a country that, um, when has China ever had a war outside its major terrain? I mean, there, there's this tale about China, whether it's uh, apocryphal or not. I mean, it, it's told by many people about a, an admiral, you know, back, I don't know, a couple of thousand years ago, whenever, who was asked to sail around, I guess, Africa and to see, you know, what the, um, what, what other countries had as a Navy. And he came back and reported, well, one of our ships, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but not by much, one of our ships could take care of their entire Navy. I mean, we're, we're, it's, our ships are like three or four times larger than their ships. And the uh, emperor of China at that time, you know what his reaction was? Destroy the ch ch ships. We don't need them. 
Uh, we basically are, you know, we, we want the ships for, for, for protection. If we don't need protection, we don't need the ships. And uh, I think that's still part of the Chinese ethos. I mean, they want what's best for the Chinese. And I think what they're doing right now is sort of building a shield around them. I mean, they don't have, I mean, the focus of their military, for example, just look, I mean, it's all defensive. It's all protecting what they have in the uh, eastern part of the world. I mean, yes, they do reach out to Brazil and to other uh, economies in uh, South America, but it's basically for resources and things like that. It's not to gain an edge so much on the United States. It really isn't, in my opinion, but rather to gain an edge for their people. And I think that that's always been their major goal. So that's why I don't think that they're, I think we perceive them as a threat and I understand why we perceive them as a threat. We've never come into contact with a country as big and as potentially as strong and powerful as China. They've become the leading trader in the world. Uh, I think in many technologies, they've either caught up or passed us. Um, and they have a very strong military, but not an offensive military. They have a very strong defensive military. And it's geared to protecting people in the uh, east, eastern part of the world. It's not geared toward, you know, having uh, bases near the U.S. It's, it's just just what you see with your eyes and what you read. Uh, it's, I, I, I'm not that worried about China as, a, as, as an aggressor. I'm really not. And if, if I could just quote from, uh, uh, you know, your, your form, the, I guess the founder of modern Singapore, LKY, is that how he's referred yeah. to? Because yeah. I won't try and say anything in, <laughs> in, in LKY. Asian. But he was interviewed by uh, Graham Allison. Uh, who is a very well-known uh, scholar who's written books on China. He's the head, head of, uh, I think, the Belfort Center at Harvard. And he wrote a book with a, another person uh, who was also very well-known. And uh, he wrote it basically on LKY. He regarded him as one of the great leaders of the 20th century, East or West. And um, quoting from him, he, he asked him, what do you think of, uh, of uh, Xi Jinping, the leader of China? And he knew him at that time. And he, I was amazed by his quote. He said that uh, he regards him uh, as emotionally tough as nails and would compare him to somebody like uh, Nelson Mandela. In other words, he's a really strong leader. But as Nelson Mandela the implication was he's for China. I mean, when you think of Nelson Mandela as, and that was the, that was the only leader to whom he compared him. It wasn't like a whole array of leaders that I, I was, I was somewhat surprised to be honest. That was after red alert. And it sort of kind of, you know, reaffirmed what I'm saying now, but, uh, it, it did, did suggest that China picks leaders that they want to represent at this point. Uh, the best that they can do for China. They don't want to pick leaders that are going to uh, uh, try and represent or try and seize power, try and become, you know, total autocrats for the sake of, you know, just accumulating power. They want to pick leaders that are not corruptible. And I think that the one thing, if you listen to what's not said about Xi, I mean, we, we say a lot of things about China. S some are at best, I think, partially true. But we, we look to say bad things. I mean, honestly, it's a sort of Cold War. But I have never heard anything regarding corruption mentioned in terms of Xi or his immediate family. Certainly his daughter or his wife are, I don't think, those are his two, you know, closest relatives. And I've never heard a, a word of actually about anything corrupt in the Xi family. He's not a corrupt guy that's just seeking... Uh, power for the sake of power and that's that would be very worrisome if you were and that would really change my mind and I think you know China could be vulnerable to that to be honest I don't know who's going to succeed Li but uh, uh, she rather I'm sorry but uh, if it's someone like she I think you know we're in pretty good shape I mean I think China is going to be uh, uh, they're, they're going to be a, a 
a cooperator more than a competitor of ours. And they could do us actually a lot more good than harm in the end. They could force America back together. They could force us to join together. And in an effort to, you know, basically take on projects that are going to be just enormous. They're going to require worldwide cooperation. Dr. Lee, China definitely is in an, an age of prosperity right now. And, and while there are statistics and economic evidence that support the continuing rise of China in the next decade, there are also reports about China's enormous debt load that could derail the country's rise. What's your opinion on this? Well, I think we've seen these reports for as long as I, you know, remember when I wrote uh, my, my, my first book on China, Red Alert, they were certainly present. And my, my take on reports, when, when you mention debt as a major problem, it, it you know, I just think of uh, a single person. A person can have a tremendous amount of debt, but if they're working and they're generating a tremendous amount of income, it's not a problem. I mean, they'll make the income, uh, they'll use the income to basically service the debt. But if a person has a, you know, a debt that is not so great, but has a very poor job that doesn't, you know, increase uh, pay and uh, basically doesn't help service the debt, you're in a lot of trouble. When you look at China, a paper that just came out recently, uh, I'm talking within the last month or two, it was a 200 page paper that was prepared by sci uh, uh, Chinese scientists and uh, 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 Chinese economists, as well as Western scientists and Western economists. And they were estimating the costs of uh, developing the sustainable society that we want, the carbon free society. Uh, the society where you can recycle things, like I was talking about sending men to the moon to mine. Just China's role in that is uh, projected to cost about $60 trillion. And if you look at worldwide costs for developing this kind of society, which is this kind of economy, which is, I think, absolutely essential if mankind is going to continue to thrive on this planet, you're talking about uh, the greatest project in the history of humankind. And uh, it's, it's, I think, going to be large enough and, and present enough challenges to make sure that China and other countries participating will be able to deal with any sort of debt that they have. I think we're going to need a new monetary system in order to help manage things. But I think that the work will be there. The ability to earn the money will be there. And I think one of the steps China is taking now, and they're taking it in full view. In fact, they're, they're the ones that are providing all the information is uh, with a country, a company like Evergrande. Now, Evergrande, maybe five years ago, if Evergrande had appeared as a major problem, we, probably, we, we, we would not have known about it they would have covered it up. I mean, it's not such a big problem that the government could not have covered up. They could have. Uh, they could have basically bailed it out and would have been, no one would have heard of it. But they made it very clear that they were not going to, you know, be focusing on, as a country, focusing on real estate and rising real estate prices as a driver of economic growth. Rather, their drivers of economic growth are going to be a sustainable economy. Now, the U.S., if they can follow and cooperate, the world will be on a wonderful path. It really will. Uh, so I'm not worried about China's debt. I'm much more worried about our debt because, I mean, we've got to figure out a way of getting, putting in motion the same kinds of, uh, what China has put in motion with respect to these sustainable society. I mean, they're, they're, they're edge and uh, they're, they're way ahead in electric vehicles. I mean, Tesla was a relatively small worldwide company until they entered China. I think Tesla's gone up I don't, maybe 20 times, 10 times since it entered China. I mean, it was a successful company, but they became a huge company entering China because China, again, wasn't trying to keep the American out who had all the good ideas. They bring them on, you know, make cars in China and sell them to the rest of the world because it will help China in the long run. And that's that 
Tesla is a very, Elon Musk is a really good example of, I think, China's attitude. Uh, we, we have Chinese scientists and well, we have a lot of Asians in our country that that do a wonderful job, but it's we're, we're not as friendly to, you know, new Asians, new immigrants uh, as we were, let's say, 20 years ago. Yet Asians are running our most successful, some of our most successful uh, technology companies like NVIDIA, like uh, Advanced Micro Devices, a company called Fortinet, which is probably the best cybersecurity company, even Microsoft. You know, after Bill Gates had founded Microsoft, it really hit a soft patch. And then an Indian leader came in, an um, Indian educated, uh, got his high school education in India, came in and started running Microsoft. And it made all the difference in the world. It turned it around. I mean, the Asian philosophy about family and meritocracy is, is what we need to bring back to America. And I think that there's a lot of room to do that. And there's, you know, a lot of instance that it, that it definitely pays off for us. We have to accept it as such and not treat every Asian that enters the country as a thief or someone that wants to, you know, steal our secrets. It's just not the case. I mean, yes, we, every country has to protect their own intellectual property. Um, but, we, you know, maybe it's our job to learn <coughs> how to protect our intellectual property. Or maybe it's our job to, you know, make treaties with China to protect our intellectual property and, and proceed from there to figure out how can we cooperate with this country uh, rather than, you know, just assume the worst about every, you know, Chinese scientist. I mean, this scientist at Harvard, now he was declared innocent, no trial. Though, I, mean, I think his career was in shambles and he was, a, you know, a leading, a leading uh, chemist. If I, if, if I, yes, I think I'm right when I say chemist. And it was accused of all sorts of things. He basically did, it was a picadillo. I mean, he did nothing, no evidence that he stole or gave back or did anything like that. I'm not saying that there, look, there are spies. Every country has spies. The U.S. was accused of spying on Merkel's telephone calls when she was uh, Chancellor of Germany. Does that make us terrible people? No. I mean, it's the way the world works. But China's not like a quantum leap worse than that. I mean, they're, you know, but those kinds of things can be dealt with. You can either view them as evidence of a country's trying to steal all your secrets, or you can view them as, hey, that's what we did. That's what we did with Britain. That's what we still do. We, we have the CIA, espionage all over the world, espionage in China. I mean, it's not, they're not unique in that way. That's what I'm saying. And it, 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 you can deal with that. You can, it doesn't preclude cooperation. It only precludes co cooperation if you want it to preclude cooperation. You know, you've said before that China's message to the world is that the yuan is as good as gold and that they are preparing for an economic revolution. How did you arrive at that conclusion? When it, that, that was sort of a misquote. It was a quote about, uh, uh, when I said it was as good as gold, I was talking about a certain period after China initiated uh, the trading of oil in, uh, in Chinese yuan. And there was a period during that time in which the yuan and gold were basically trading exactly the same. And the significance I said was that in during this period, there was no difference between the yuan and gold. So, and, and what was important about that is that at, if you bought or sold your oil on, let's say the Chinese exchange for oil, you would, you know, get yuan, but, the Chinese allowed you to convert that yuan into gold. And I was just saying at that time, I mean, they were showing, or, you know, I don't know how they were doing it, but for whatever reason, there was no difference between how the yuan and gold were trading. So it was basically a way of illustrating that you could set up a world in which using gold as a background, as a backer of uh, currency, it made a lot of sense. Uh, that was really the sense in which I used it. But as far as a monetary revolution, yes, I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think that, again, if you read what the Chinese have said about that, uh, their former chairman of the PBC, 
uh, wrote a white paper in in 2009 and basically is advocating I mean I went through the evidence for what he was saying you know you had to sort of read between the lines but it was clearly advocating for a uh, basket of currencies not just the one it may start with the one it may start very very soon like in the next month they may introduce their digital currency or their digital one and uh, that may be de facto backed by gold uh, because you can exchange yuan for gold in China in the international uh, zones and uh, for a while you may have a, uh, a yuan that's traded internationally and can be exchanged for gold but they do not want that and this is another this is I'm glad you asked that because it's another really strong point when uh, the I, I wish I could pronounce his name but he was one of the he's still still alive and he's one of the great considered one of the great monetary leaders in China when he wrote his paper what he emphasized is that a sovereign currency should never be the reserve currency you really need a basket of currencies he was talking about the SDRs that would be an ideal currency because you don't want one country's political aims to interfere with another country's political aims which is inevitable if you have a single uh, uh, sovereign currency whether it be the yuan whether it be the dollar whether it be the yen whatever that or the euro even I mean to the extent it's a little less sovereign than some of the others but it, it, it would be uh, it's a mistake and there there are certain problems there's something called the Triflin uh, dilemma etc associated with the single currency being the, the the reserve currency so he advocated right in that paper and that the sovereign currency for the world the world's reserve currency not the sovereign currency the re reserve currency for the world should be a basket of currencies and it should be backed by a uh, commodity and the only commodity that would fit the bill would be gold because it's unique it's the only commodity that's not needed for industrial uses you can't have a currency backed by commodities that are going to run short on supply I mean it just you know you would have chaos but gold it stays I mean you don't need gold even for industrial applications you can substitute other applications for gold so I think it makes a you know that's their goal this is not the goal of someone who's seeking to dominate the world it's the goal of, of someone who wants a currency that can help the world as a whole manage its growth in what is going to be probably the most consequential period of time that we've ever experienced on this planet as it, you know in terms of being civilized creatures that are now uh, uh, running and trying to control you know the economy and the well-being of what seven eight billion people we need a currency that is going to represent everybody and that you cannot it has to be disciplined representation I mean anybody looking at the US right now doesn't see a trace of discipline in terms of how we're managing it you, an infinite amount of dollars is not going to buy a finite amount of commodities it just won't happen and you know I could go on and on but I won't you know trouble you with that of where that has failed but oil certainly one example uh, where we tried to buy more oil than we could uh, than, than, than was practical than was profitable and it led to all sorts of problems which we're still experiencing today I mean fracking was it was a terrible example of what too much money could do I mean uh, there were successful frackers they still are but it was never an industry that could make America independent on and independent of anybody of, of all other countries but we pushed it and as a result fracking as a whole ended up as a um, unprofitable industry we lost I don't you depending on how you measure it I mean someone could come up with a half a billion uh, 500 billion dollars half a trillion maybe even a whole trillion when you count the opportunity costs etc that we lost because of fracking whereas if it had just been well let's get the oil out of the ground that is profitable it would have been useful it would have been a very nice addition to our oil but now it's something we're still paying for 
And it's something that's making this transition very difficult. And it's something that arose because America could basically finance, they, they could finance a trillion dollar loss, no problem, because they could print as much money as they wanted. But, you know, it's complicated. I don't want to go into all the details, but basically it's common sense. You cannot run a world if you can print much more money than there are things to buy. And that's what America is right now. They can print as much money as they want, but they cannot buy as much as they want because it's not there to be bought. Okay, you know, you brought up an interesting point there where, you know, we talked a bit about uh, monetary systems of central bank digital currencies, SDR, and and. We kind of forgot about that SDR, which does have gold in that basket of currencies that make up the SDR. But Dr. Lieb, how certain are you that the next monetary system will be based on gold again? I, I can't say I'm 100 I wish I could say 100% certain. Um, I'm certain to the extent that if you're going to tell me that the world is going to uh, basically thrive, over the next hundred years, that a hundred years from now, we're going to have a better, more prosperous world than we have today. I, I would say I'm almost a hundred percent certain gold will have to play a, war, a role in that kind of uh, progress. Uh, if we're not going to make it, we don't, you know, there's no guarantee. I mean, you can believe in the sacred, whatever, you know, I was, I think I was talking to you maybe off camera or on camera, whatever your beliefs are, it's not going to make, I don't think it's going to change the fact that the world is really going to suffer and maybe probably catastrophically unless we succeed in uh, creating a sustainable society. And I think the only way we can succeed in creating a sustainable society is to have the sort of discipline that a gold standard will impose on the world, not just our country, not just, uh, you know, China, but the entire world. Because uh, without that discipline, I think we have no chance whatsoever. So if the world is going to be prosperous, I'm nearly 100% sure. If the world's not going to make it, you know, all bets are off. But I think gold is critical. It's a necessary component to uh, future prosperity. I really do believe that. I know it sounds odd to, you know, call what some people say are a uh, barbarous relic and, and, and putting such a role in that. But think of it as if you would never discipline a child, and let the child do whatever he wants, buy as much candy, do whatever he wants. What's the chances that child's going to work out and, and grow up to be a very productive man? I would say probably zero. And in a world like today's, the only way of effectively disciplining our control of our monies and making sure they're spent in the right way would be through a mechanism that includes gold. Because again, it's totally unique. It's the only major commodity that has uh, uh, basically not needed, is not needed for industrial uh, uh, goods. And it's the only major commodity that's, all of it's still around. I mean, there's some people, a lot of people claim that every bit of gold that's been mined is, is still there. It's still with us. And you need that kind of stability in order to uh, basically manage a world today in which everything we do has to be measured. And basically there has to be a tremendous focus on productivity. We're not going to spend our way out of this crisis. There are some problems and almost every problem America has faced in the last 40 or 50 years have been problems that could be cured by money spending. You know, you could spend your way out of virtually every problem that we had. We now are facing a problem that you cannot spend your way out of. And the only way to manage a problem like that is with the kind of discipline that the gold standard has imposed on us. And my evidence is so simple. The 70 best years of the American enterprise, the American, you know, experience have been the 70 years that the gold standard has basically been the underlying monetary system of this country. And I don't know why people don't see that. I really, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm not just talking about the years after the Second World War. I'm again talking about the years after the Civil War. 
they were the years of greatest prosperity in this country. Why don't we see that? China evidently does see that, and maybe they see it through the mistakes that we've made. Uh, and I think they, they need us. We need them. I think they're aware that they need us to cooperate. I don't think it's a, a, a phony, I, I don't think they're being phony in any way, shape or form. And just one example that I just became aware of, I think in the last couple of days, they have invited uh, or accepted the, the, uh, the plea that uh, the UN uh, official that's in charge of uh, human rights be allowed to visit the uh, northwestern province in, in China where all the so-called genocide regarding Uyghurs are involved. I haven't been there. I can't say for sure. I mean, the evidence that I see is that it's wildly exaggerated. Uh, there's many mosques per uh, Muslims in China as there are in fact more mosques per Muslim in China than there are in America. I mean, that's not evidence of a country that's committing genocide, but more evidence of a country that is protecting themselves against terrorist attacks. But I think with the Afghan war over, uh, there's much less need to protect themselves against terrorist attacks. That border that they share with Afghanistan up in that northwestern province, that's going to be, you know, basically a, a border that's not going to be nearly as worrisome as it once was. And it's their willingness to accept the UN uh, a team to visit uh, that province, I think, could be very, very significant. And maybe it will convince people in this country that the worst crimes we're accusing China of, you know, maybe they've done, th I'm sure they've done things that are wrong and maybe very wrong, but not nearly as wrong as we paint them. And I think that that will become hopefully very clear and it will be another uh, quiver in the bow to suggest that China really wants to cooperate. They really want to present themselves to the world as part of a world that has to engage in a massive project to make the entire planet, uh, uh, you know, independent of uh, uh, basically fossil fuels of uh, carbon, to take carbon out of the uh, mix to assure that our environment and our climate remain basically livable. Uh, this, is, this is not a project that China can do alone. It's not a project the U.S. can do alone. It's a project that must be done together and must be done with a lot of discipline. Okay, Dr. Lee, final question here. You mentioned gold, you mentioned prosperity, you mentioned discipline. Is it fair to then say that for these things to happen, we simply have to get rid of the dollar as we know it. I would say you know, one word answer is yes, that uh, the, the dollar should be part of a basket of currencies, but it should not be as we know it today, the reserve currency for the world. No, it, we should, we, we must get rid of it. In fact, it's not, it's not an option if we want this world to, you know, really prosper in the next 100 years, 50, 100 years, 30, 40 years ahead. We're going to have nothing but problems as long as the dollar remains a reserve currency. And I think that you're going to see changes probably sooner rather than later at this point. I think we've kind of reached a critical point right now, close to a point of inflection because of what you're seeing right now in America, 7% inflation. You're, you're not going to cure America's problems of a lack of education, uh, of uh, not having access to, you know, materials. I mean, one of the things that uh, Chairman Powell said the other day is that semiconductor uh, uh, shortages are, are likely to run for perhaps another two years. You're not going to solve that problem no matter how much money you spend. You only solve these kinds of problems through cooperation and spending money very effectively and very usefully, which is what America used to do for the sake of, you know, real productivity. And you, you're not going to be able to do that with the dollar as a reserve currency. So if this world is going to thrive, the dollar as we know it has to die, has to, you know, change. Dr. Lee, before we wrap up, can you let the viewers know how they can learn more about you and follow your work? Sure. Uh, basically, my, I have a website and it's Stephen Lieb, uh, one word, dot com. 
and it'll take you, you know, to a website that gives you a bunch of choices, uh, you know, to learn about. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll not be selling you anything. We'll be just introducing you to, you know, information that we think you need to know and spread in order to make this world a survivable place for your children and your children's children. So that's it, StephenLieb.com. Okay, Dr. Stephen Lee, we've heard a lot of new things today, interesting things today. I appreciate your insight and your time, and I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you so much, Patrick. I really enjoyed the interview and the chances you gave me to, you know, say what I think needs to be said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Stephen Lee sharing his insights on China and the economy. To see more of Dr. Lee's work, please visit his website, www.lieb. Dot net and on Twitter at Dr. Underscore Lieb. If you like this video, please do subscribe, like, share, and give it a thumbs up to let the algos know you want to see more of our content. Audio-only versions can be found on iTunes and Spotify.